let's talk about lesson five, which is basically an introduction to scatter plots, correlation, and a little bit of a term called regression. Now, the way we've been studying data sets up until now has been dealing with one number. You ask someone one question, they give you one answer, and usually it's a number, and so then you list all the number of answers you got. Okay? We might have said what was the average age, or what was the median age, or what was the mode age, what was the range of the ages, what was the standard deviation, uh, which age is the 30th percentile, which age is the third quartile. You know, we did all those things. Then we even looked in terms of a normal distribution, which basically would take a whole bunch of ages and generalize the shape of a smooth curve. Now what we're going to do, instead of asking somebody one question, we're going to ask them two questions. Okay? We went up, for example, and surveyed some people and said, what was your IQ and what was your annual income in thousands of dollars? So if someone said, I have an IQ of 110 and I make $30,000 a year. Another person said, I have an IQ of 115 and I make $32,000 a year. And then we have three more people with their IQs and how much they made. Okay? Now, why would we be interested in the relationship between IQ and the annual income? To see if the higher IQ has an effect on their income. Very good. Usually you would expect if I have a higher IQ, if I am smarter, I will have the opportunity to get the jobs that are going to pay me more money. Why else are you coming to school? You know, why else do you study for tests? Why else do you work on this so that you can get this degree to get this job that you want to get? So you think if I have a higher IQ or higher grades or whatever you want to study, will that help me have a higher income, for example? Okay, so it seems reasonable. Now, do you think these two uh, variables are related? Let's say teachers got a raise this year. And at the same time, beer sales went up. So do you think the fact that teacher salaries went up and the fact that beer sales went up, do you think that they're directly related to each other? No. You could pick two variables that either increase or decrease or do a certain pattern of something, but they're not related to each other. Does it seem at least a little reasonable that IQ and income would be related? Sure. But is IQ the only factor? No, there are a ton of factors that go into what your income is going to end up being. Now, realize what we're doing again is a very quick introduction. We're not going to get real deep into this, but we're looking at one factor to influence another thing. Okay, you can do what's called multiple regression. You can really get in depth and spend the rest of your life studying how variables are related to each other. And you can say, well, here are some factors involved in this final result. We're just going to focus on one. Okay? Now, as far as focusing on this one factor to try to figure out if it will help me determine annual income, what I want to do is I want to draw what's called a scatter plot. Now we've been drawing some graphs. We've drawn the histogram, we've drawn the frequency polygon, the stem and leaf plot, and we've even drawn now the normal distribution curves. A scatter plot is going to be points, like your plot in X and Y, where you have this X value with this Y value. Okay, so income is going to be an X value, and excuse me, IQ is going to be an X value, income is going to be a Y value. And on the X axis, I'm going to label some tick marks so I can plot these points. Now, just like I did with the histogram, I have to label a scale. I can't just label any old tick mark I want. I want an actual scale and then put my data on the scale. So I'm going to make sure it's as low as 110 and as high as 135. And notice I picked a scale of 10 and I put a little break in the graph and then I started labeling it 110. So you don't have to start at zero because we're way above zero at this point. We can go anywhere from 110 up to 135, so I picked a nice even scale of 10. Do you have to use the same scale as me? No, you don't. Okay, pick whatever scale you want, 
You could have done 110, 115, 120, 125, 130, 135. That would be fine as well. Now I'm going to do the same thing for annual income, and I want to make sure I have it as low as 30 and as high as 44. So I'm going to pick some scale, whatever I want to use. I'm going to put another break in the graph and then just start drawing it and labeling it where I'm comfortable. So maybe 30. I'll do a scale of 5. 35, 40, 45. And so I have my x-axis and my y-axis. Now, if you were turning in this graph for a grade, is there anything else before you plot the data that you need to include? You need to label it. You need to label it. Perfect. So you need to tell me that this is IQ because you don't want to make your reader guess what's on the axis. You want this as simple, as easy as possible. And you'll label this one annual income. And put in thousands of dollars somewhere on your graph so that someone doesn't think that they're earning only $30 a year. That would be very disappointing. Okay? That would definitely be disappointing. So you want that to be read as $30,000, but you don't want to take the right time to write all the zeros. So that you're just doing that to save yourself some writing time. Now, this is back to maybe your algebra days where you went to plot data. And you've got a scale here. If you want to use graph paper in the future, feel free. Um, you may see some graphs pre-drawn for you, or I may leave it completely blank and let you decide how you want it to look. But you're welcome to use graph paper for practice. But I need to plot this person's information as one point. So I need to show an IQ of 110 with a salary of 30,000. And I'm just going to put a dot. And all I'm going to do is have some points scattered. I'm not going to connect them. What time did you connect points? What graph? It was the frequency polygon. You do not connect the points on this one. Okay? All right, on the next one, 115 and 32. So I'll estimate where 115 is and where I think 32 would be. And I'll put a dot, but I will not connect it. Okay? You never connect the dots. Next one is 120 with 36. So I'm going to say about right here. And all of a sudden, they don't look like they're in a straight line. But that's okay. They're not going to be. Uh, 125 and 40. Estimate probably something like that. And again, it's not a straight line, but I don't expect it to be that. Last one's 135 and 44. So maybe about right there. And that's all you have to do for your graph. That's a scatter plot. So just like your histograms, put a scale, put a name. Put a scale, put a name. But this time you only plot the points, and these points represent each person who answered two questions. <coughs> now, even though they don't form a perfect straight line, do they form the pattern of a straight line? Yes. Now that's the first and most basic pattern you'll study when you start dealing with scatter plots. Okay? You could have patterns that are curved. You could have patterns that maybe increase exponentially. I mean, you could have all sorts of patterns. But that's not the, the biggest concern right now. We're going to study one pattern, the basic one of just a linear pattern. If it had a line to describe it, because back in your algebra days you did a little bit of lines. Do you know if this line would have a positive slope or a negative slope? I'm hearing both answers. Which one do you think it is? It's, it's going to be a positive slope. Anytime both things increase together, that's a positive slope. IQ was going up and annual income looked like it was going up. Okay? This would be a positive linear relationship. Okay, a positive linear relationship. Now I'm going to ask you to describe your relationships. So those are the kind of things I'm looking for. I want positive or negative. 
Now, negative would look something like point scatter, where they're one, it looks like going down. Okay, one variable's going up, the other one's going down. Okay, and you'd have a shape something like this. And again, it's not going to form a perfect straight line, but it's going to form the pattern of a straight line. Okay. As far as this forming the pattern of a straight line, and we said it's positive, does that look like a pretty strong pattern, a moderate pattern, or a weak pattern? What do you feel in your gut right now? Strong. I'd say pretty strong. Okay. Now, based on the graph, I'd say, yeah, it's pretty strong. But I need a better way to be comfortable with that decision. So this, again, is an example out of your notes. Correlation coefficient is 0.9894. Now, correlation coefficient, all that means is how strong is the linear pattern. You feel like that's pretty strong. I agree with you, but graphs can be misleading, so you have to be careful. If you see a number that's really close to 1 without going over, then it's really strong. So then I would feel comfortable saying this is a strong positive linear relationship. Now what would make me say it's not quite so strong is if this number had been more maybe the 0 0.6, 0 0.7 <coughs> range. If I had gotten an answer like that, that would have said, mm, this is not as strong as it could be. Weak is definitely getting closer to zero. Anything that's getting closer to zero would definitely be a weak strength as far as the linear relationship. Um, what's something that could look like zero? Here's a scatter plot. Does that form the pattern of a straight line? No. This one would have an R probably of something like 0 0.102 or something like that, just to make it up. That's very weak. There is not a linear pattern here. And what you want to do, the reason you want to know this number is the stronger it is, the better off you feel about making a prediction. Because you're actually going to be allowed to make a prediction now. But the stronger it is, I'll be happier about my prediction. I still can't guarantee things, but I feel pretty good about what to expect. But when I have very weak correlation relationships, linear relationships, then I don't want to use it for a prediction. Okay, it won't help me at all. Okay, because it's not a linear pattern. Now, this has a positive slope. So we said it had a positive relationship. Notice that the correlation coefficient is also what? Positive. Okay, that's together. The slope and the correlation coefficient will both be positive or they'll both be negative. So what's the slope of this one? It's a negative slope, whatever it is. What would the correlation value be? It had to be what? It's got to be negative. Now, I don't know if it's really strong or moderate or weak. I mean, I wouldn't say it's weak, but it's still not perfect like this one is. That one's almost perfect. If it formed a straight line, it'd be perfect. But it's still pretty decent, okay? But I do know it's negative, okay? The equation. Now, the whole point of doing all this is so that you can say, well, guess what? If you're a person who has an IQ of, let's say, 130, what could I predict your, your annual income to be? 42,000. Well, you can guess, and I don't know if it's exactly 42,000, but you can guess and try to figure it out, or you can use what's called the regression equation. Now, this is something that you do not have to calculate. However, I'm going to tell you what it is. So y is going to equal, and it's some decimals, 0.5892x minus 34.8919. Now, as you can see, I have four decimal places for those numbers, so I'm being very precise. When I try to be that precise, I really don't want to round too much. I want to be very careful. And how do I use that? Because say, well, what if someone had an IQ of 130? Well, IQ is the X variable. 
So if I have an IQ of 130, I can substitute 130 in place of X in that equation and I can work it out. Now this I would strictly do on the calculator. So those numbers are going to be given to you the Yes ma'am. The, the equation will be given to you. You do not have to figure that part out. If you were in a statistics class, you would learn how to do that. So 0.5892 times 130 minus 34.8919. Now remember our guess was 42,000, okay? According to the regression equation, we're close to the guess. We're looking at a salary of probably $41,704. Don't worry about the last one. That could just be cents, but we don't need to get that precise as far as what our salary would be. So it's close to what we were guessing, but sometimes it's hard to guess because you might have a whole bunch of points all scattered up here and then you don't know what to guess really. So you'll use the equation to make your prediction. And again, I'm going to give you the equation. I'm going to give you the R value. I'm going to let you know what the actual number is to help you say, is it strong, is it moderate, is it weak? But simply for the predictions, you just substitute whichever value I'm giving you. Okay? Any questions so far? All right, let's talk just a little bit more about the R value. Remember I said your R is going to have the same sign as your slope would be. If your slope is positive, then R has to be positive. If your slope is negative, R has to be negative. R can range anywhere from 1 down to negative 1. You will never see R bigger than 1. Anything like 1.5 or 38. You'll never see those. They don't exist. If you actually went through the calculation, you would see why. You'll never see anything smaller than negative 1. Same reasons, but anything between these two numbers you can get. Now, if you're closer to 0, that is very weak. Okay, if you're closer to 0, it's very weak. You don't have a line pattern jumping out at you. If you are exactly 1, this is the picture you have. And do you notice that all the points, if I was to draw the line, fall on the line? Now, if I tried to do that over here, let's see. Do all my points fall on the line? Mm -hmm. But are they close to it? Mm -hmm. Okay, see how close they are? That's measured in this number. Okay? That would be R equals 1, a perfect positive linear relationship. Perfect positive linear relationship. What do you think negative one's going to mean? Perfect. Perfect. Per perfect negative linear relationship. And all your points would fall on the line. But typically, in real life, what you're going to see are R values that are between minus 1 and 1, the regression equation that goes with it to help you make a prediction. Now, I said this helps you make a prediction. <clears throat> Can I be guaranteed now that for any person who came up to me and said, my IQ is 130, I'm not making that salary. What can I say about that? What kind of job do you have? Okay. What else could be involved? What kind of job? Could be the size of the company they're working for. Okay, size of the company you're working for. How, How much, much are they getting paid? How much are they getting paid? Is it more or less? <coughs> That's a good deal. How much you work? How much you work? 
Those are all things we didn't study, right? The only thing we studied was IQ. We said we have a pretty good feeling you're going to have a salary around this number. Is that a guarantee? No. Nothing is ever a guarantee. And the biggest thing about this is you are just looking for relationships. You want to see if there's a relationship between them, but you are not guaranteeing anything. You are just going to say, guess what? There's a positive linear relationship. It's pretty strong between IQ and annual income. But there are other factors involved in what kind of income you will have. Okay? I cannot guarantee that IQ is the only thing that determines it. If you ever listen to people talk about research and they're talking about a couple of variables, they'll talk about how strongly related are they. They will also say probably that this one variable does not <coughs> necessarily cause the other variable. So I am in no way, shape, or form saying IQ causes annual income. I'm only saying there's a pretty good relationship between the two, okay? Don't ever say cause, because you don't know what caused that to happen. And just because you can figure out possibly the cause for one person, doesn't mean you figure out the cause for another person. And income has a lot to do with where you're located, all your education, the, the shape of the business at the time, you know, right now economy is not as good, so we don't necessarily have as high salaries being offered sometimes. Depends on where you live. If you live in a big city, people are going to tend to have higher salaries versus if you live out in the country, they're going to tend to have lower salaries sometimes. Okay? So there are a lot of factors that go into it. And plus, if we really wanted to study this, do you think five points is enough to determine a relationship? No. Now, we picked five to make it easy to work with. But really, when you do this, you're going to survey lots of people. And how many people you survey depends on what kind of thing you're trying to answer. But you might survey hundreds of people or more. So it depends on what you're trying to say about the information. But our goal is to take our data, draw a graph. You do not have to draw this line, okay, and do not connect the dots. That is your scatter plot. Make sure you label it like you're supposed to. I'll give you a correlation coefficient to help you decide how strong you want to say it is. And make sure you tell me positive or negative. And then i also ask you to use the estimated regression equation to make a prediction. That's the best you can do. You have to use the tools you have. The tool I'm giving you is the equation. Um, other than that, you know, we can get real in-depth with this, um, but we're going to, you know, focus just on this quick introduction, recognizing weak values versus perfect or even very strong or moderate values. So you'll get a, a chance to look at some scatter plots and read some graphs. Um, make sure you look at the practice, uh, excuse me, practice problems on the notes on Moodle so that you can look at those as well. Okay? Any questions? Is that it? Okay, well that's it for lesson five. All right, let's pick back up with the normal distribution problem we were working on. We were looking at systolic blood pressures. Uh, we're assuming they follow a normal distribution which gives them this shape, bell-shaped. We have a mean of 108 and a standard deviation of 14, and I've explained how to get these numbers across the axis. Now what we want to do is to look on our curve and try to figure out the percentage from certain areas. Okay, So if we do that, remember what I said before. No matter what your distribution is, if you have that curve, it will work in every situation. So I'm going to quickly sketch my normal distribution curve again. I'm going to put 108 in the middle. I'm going to mark off three standard deviations above it and try to spread them out evenly. I got these a little too close, but spread them out evenly. And three standard deviations below it. We had 108, and we added 14 each time, and came up with the following numbers. We subtracted 14 each time, and came up with these numbers. And now I'm going to use this chart, and I'm going to break things up into sections. I explained to you what numbers come from each section. So I want to just kind of summarize it. And for any problem, this will always work. 
So the next thing I want to do is just write down, well, this was 34%, and this was 34%. Then we had 13.5% on the two sides. And then we had 2.35%. So you notice it keeps getting smaller and smaller. And then the tail ends were 0.15%. Very tiny percentage of this happening. But it's still possible. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to answer the following questions. So I'll occasionally refer back to this as I do each question. So first of all, this one says about 68% of the blood pressures are between blank and blank. Well, 68% is a common empirical rule number, and 68% represents from one standard deviation to the next. So I'm looking at one below and one above. And what I basically have here is a 34 and a 34. So what I'll do is I'll say 34% plus 34%. That would be 68%. So that does equal 68. I know I'm on the right track, and I just need to record the 94 and the 122. So 68% will be approximately between 94 and 122. Okay, moving on to the next one, 95%. Well, that should jump out at me very quickly. 95% would be two standard deviations above and also two below. So we're looking at 80 to 136. And so very quickly, I can tell you what I expect. How often do I expect it? 95% of the time, the systolic blood pressure will be between 80 and 136. It's those other smaller percentage times where we run into trouble. OK, here's a question. I've worded it a little bit different. About blank percent of the blood pressures are between 66 and 150. Now, 66 and 150, notice they're both three standard deviations above and three standard deviations below. Well, that means I can go with my empirical rule number, and I've already learned 99.7. So these three questions are very straightforward, where they let me use the empirical rule and move one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below, or two above and two below, or three above and three below. It gets a little bit trickier when you try to change and don't just use standard deviations. So these three questions help you deal with moving it to a different position. So for example, 94 and 108. What is the percentage of blood pressures that are between 94 and 108? Well, 94 and 108 is just this little section. But I already have it labeled as 34%. If I was drawing a picture of this, I might do a quick little curve, put 108 under the highest part, put 94 to the left. I happen to know that this area, this percentage represents 34%. So you can very quickly draw pictures to help describe what you're looking at. Okay, what about this one? What is the percentage of blood pressures that are between 80 and 122? Now 80 and 122, if I was to draw a picture, I put 108 in the middle. That's my average. 122 is my first standard deviation away. 80 is two standard deviations away. So I went one up and two down. So I have three little sections. <clears throat> this one is 13.5. This one is 34. And this one is 34. If I simply add those three numbers, each one of these are percents, then I'll end up with 81.5%. So you don't have to be restricted to just standard deviation numbers that fit the empirical rule. You're allowed to move around a little bit. The last one says, what percentage of blood pressure is above 136? Okay, let's look at that again. Draw a quick little picture, put 108 in the middle, and I know that my picture had 122, 136, and I want above 136. 
and it also went out to 150. So I have these two sections from 136 to 150, and I also have 150 and above. So if I take these two sections, just these two, 2.35 and the 0.15, I end up with 2.5%. And so, like I said, you're not restricted to the empirical rules, standard deviations. You're allowed to do a little bit more. Uh, you have a little more flexibility. You could even do things like uh, 110, 115, 123, but that would be a little bit more involved course, and, and we're not going to go quite that far. So your numbers will still fall in your standard deviations, but this is how you would deal with them. If you have any questions, please let me know.